Good evening. Good evening. Glad to see you all out tonight. Let's turn in our uh, inspiring hymnals to hymn 406, Depth of Mercy. We'll sing the first, third, and last verses of Depth of Mercy, hymn 406. Advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, that if we sin, we can confess our sins, and that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, help us to do as the Savior said, and go and sin no more. <clears throat> Lord, we pray that you will bless our worship this night, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Is your favorite? Carol? 300. Three ought ought. Or not not. And we'll sing the first and the last. Ring the bells of heaven and rejoice today for a soul returning from the Six eight two hundred sixty eight. We'll sing the first and last. Yeah. 
417. We'll sing the first and second. back memories for me. I don't know if any of you recall, but uh, one time Peter formed a, a men's group, and this was one of the, f it wasn't from this, it was a special arrangement, but it was uh, Peter and I and Bob Myers and somebody. <laughs> Miss Lee? 223. Sing the first and last. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing all worth His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, Christ our gracious in glory. Strength and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd. Jesus will guard his children, in his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his 
the last before our offering. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we'll sing the first, third, and last. Thanks. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ came to earth and died for our sins. He died for me, for each one of us here. How we thank you that he rose from the dead and he rose for me and for each of us here. How we thank you that someday he's coming again for each one of us and how we praise you for that. Father, we pray that as we look forward to his imminent return, that each of us will give graciously, generously, freely, with love and joy and with thanksgiving in our hearts because you have given to us all that we have in Jesus name Amen All right, in preparation for the message, let's turn to number 436. I am resolved no longer to linger charmed by the world's delight. Number 436, and we'll stand to sing. Thank you. you. May be seated. 
Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 15. Wonderful passage of Scripture before us tonight, one that is very practical, one that helps us to know how we should be living the Christian life, avoiding stumbling blocks. We're in Acts chapter 15. Tonight, the Lord willing, we'll be looking at verses 19 through 21. Acts chapter 15, 19 through 21. You recall that last week we were looking at the eternal plan of God, rather interesting in the context that we find it because it's the council at Jerusalem. It is a fight that's going on over circumcision and we have a discussion about the eternal plan of God to include the Gentiles in the great promises that God has for his people. Beginning in verse 13, and after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that you will encourage our hearts, direct our thoughts, give us practical application so that we might know how to live in this very difficult world where Satan is always trying to confuse things, make things blurry, keep us from seeing black versus white, keep us from seeing the bright line tests, causing everything to look gray and fuzzy. Help us, Father, so that we might learn how to walk in a way that is pleasing to you, edifying to the believers and a good testimony before those who are unsaved in the world around us. We pray for your blessings upon this, your word, as it goes forth tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall last week as we were looking at that passage that the apostle to the Jews was the one that God used to bring the Gentiles into the body of Christ. That was Peter back in Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 48. And Peter has just spoken before James begins to speak here in verse 13 and following. He is reminding them what Peter said and that Peter, because he is the apostle, to the Jews has a great deal of authority in talking about the Gentiles because he is the one who brought the Gentiles into the body of Christ, or we should say the instrument that God used to bring the Gentiles into the body of Christ. Peter's testimony was back there in verses 7 through 11. That particular ingathering of Gentiles, which is cited here by James in this passage in 13 through 18, is actually prophesied in Isaiah 59.10 and Isaiah 60 verses 1 through 5. The Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come to thee. We also looked at the book of Daniel last week in somewhat more detail in verses 13 through 14 in chapter 7, where it says, And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And of course we noted that there are many other Old Testament passages which teach that God was going to do a special work among the Gentiles, although the Jews were his specially chosen people, and we find that of course throughout the entire Old Testament. And then James says, and to this agree the words of the prophets. So he not only makes the general allusions that we've just mentioned here, but he also quotes Amos 9, verses 11 and 12. He had a Jewish audience who accepted the inspiration of the Old Testament scripture. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Eden, and all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. And we pointed out the uh, horrible translations based on the Westcott Hort text, which basically eliminate this verse and uh, turn it into gibberish. The correct text reads, as you have in your Bibles, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. That led us into a discussion of foreknowledge and its connection to the doctrines of predestination and election. Predestination is the determining of 
the eternal destinies of men and angels and other moral creatures prior to their creation. Election is the individual choice of each and every one of those who will be with Christ throughout all of eternity. And we notice that foreknowledge is not merely looking down the corridors of time and seeing who would believe and choosing on the basis of man's prior choice. No, foreknowledge is looking and seeing all the possibilities of things that could be based on God's initial acts. God, as we pointed out, could have chosen not to create Adam and Eve. He could have created something else, Zog and Bork. He didn't do it. He could have created us with many different character qualities. We could have had green skin. We could have had uh, double noses. We could have had triple eyes. We could have had one extra hair beyond what we have right now. God had an infinite number of possibilities when he created Adam and Eve and their genetic posterity, an infinite number of possibilities of all things that could be, and he chose one particular plan to which he committed himself so that it would bring him the greatest amount of glory, it would result in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and that he might bring many sons to glory with himself and it included even such things as Satan and his creation. God could have chosen not to do that. God could have chosen not to create the angels that followed Satan. He did not choose that particular plan. Foreknowledge is not merely God seeing what's going to happen and biting his fingernails, hoping it will happen and come about like he wants it to. Foreknowledge is the definite choice of God's predetermined plan in eternity past based on all the possibilities that ever could have been and God made sure that only one happened, for it maximized his glory. Where the Armenian view departs from scripture on this, they make God subject to history, rather than making history subject to God. And our text made that clear last week, Acts 15, 18, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. It does not say known unto God are all man's works from the beginning of the world, though that's an obvious truism. But man can do nothing outside the sovereign will of God. Even our good works, that is our works of faith, done in the power of the Holy Spirit, done to the glory of God, and in obedience to the word of God, even those good works were predestined by God. For we are his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which, that is the good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He predestined our good works. Otherwise, you wouldn't do any good works because you would not do works of faith. You would not do works in the power of the Holy Spirit. You would not do good works in obedience to the word of God. You would not do good works that glorify God. All your works would be carnal works. But God has predestined good works that you will do, that you will walk in them. And yet he holds you accountable for doing it and gives you blessings for doing it. Isn't that strange? It seems so odd to us because it doesn't fit human reason. But it is based on revelation that God is the one who is working in you to perform the good thing until the day of Christ Jesus. God is the one who is sovereignly, supernaturally, <coughs> in control of all that is and all that will be. Because it ultimately brings him the greatest amount of glory. Even the decisions of the greatest kings, we noted, were controlled by the hand of God. We looked at Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever and ever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand, or say unto him, What doest thou? The eternal plan of God controls, but men are still held accountable. I know that's a difficult truth to understand, but it's based on revelation, not on reason. There's a great war that goes on between revelation and reason, and it goes on in the church, not just between the humanists and the biblicists. Revelation versus reason. But for us, there is also a particular conflict on that issue of Revelation versus reason. By the way, when there is a conflict, always go with revelation, not with reason. Revelation is not unreasonable, but revelation trumps human reason. For us, the particular issue is not, as we see here in the text tonight, 
the issue of circumcision, but for us who are in the tradition of the Reformation, the issue is, did Christ die for the sins of the elect only, or did Christ die for the sins of the world? I'm using this as an illustration so that you'll see what is happening in the next three verses, which are what are our study tonight. Reason says, if Christ died for the sins of the whole world, then everybody would have to be saved. And that would end with universalism. We know that universalism is not true because the Bible talks about an eternal hell where some will spend eternity. If nobody else, devil and Judas are going to end there and certainly the angels that followed Lucifer, Satan, when he fell. There is an eternal hell where some will spend eternity. We know that man does not have a truly free will. He's dead in his trespasses and sins, not sick. And he could never choose God unless he was elect. Therefore, now here's the conclusion that is reached based on those true premises. Therefore, logical conclusion based on reason, Christ must have died for the elect only. Folks, that is a logical conclusion. That is a reasonable conclusion. But that is not a revelational conclusion. You looked at all those true premises that we went through there. Certainly not the whole world is going to be saved. That's universalism. The devil's not going to be saved. The demons aren't going to be saved. We're going to see that Judas ends up in hell because it says so in the text. Many true premises, but notice the conclusion is based on human reason rather than scripture. In contrast, the scripture says, 1 John 2.2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. John is setting a contrast there, ours and theirs. 2 Corinthians 5.19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Again, you notice that contrast, the us and the them. Hebrews 2.9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And of course, you all know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Only some will believe, and we know this. But that does not negate either the infinite death of Christ or the infinite love of God. It's obvious from all of those and many other passages that it's a true statement to say that Christ died for the elect because the elect are included in the phrase, the whole world. They're included in the term all. But you'll notice that none of those verses or any other verses, and you can search as long as you wish, and I've done that for years, because this is a conflict that I've had to run into ever since I was in seminary, and ever since my father went to the other side. None of those verses say Christ died for the elect only. They say that Christ died for the elect. You'll find many verses that say that, but you will never find a verse that says Christ died for the elect only. Many of us in the Reformed tradition point out the term world is used in seven different ways in the Bible, such as the term world is used for the physical planet that we live on. The term world is used for the ancient Roman Empire. The one out of decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. That's the Roman Empire that's being taxed because that's what's under Caesar's control. We can see that. But then we hear the assertion that they say that since the term is used in many different ways, it is plausible to posit that it also means the world of the elect. Then they conclude, without contextual basis, that this is what it must mean in all of those difficult passages that I've just read to you. Therefore, they assert that it must mean the world of the elect because they've already started with the premise that the atonement is limited to the elect. But you'll notice that none of the verses defines the term world anywhere in the Bible as the world of the elect. All the other meanings of the term world are clear from their contexts. 
Let me give you one illustration. An illustration of Jesus loving one who rejected him is found in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 23. Mark 10, verses 17 through 23. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Okay, what's our context? We're talking about eternal life. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about a guy who wants to go to heaven. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Now look at verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. The word translated loved him is agapao. That's the divine form of love, agape. It's the verbal form here, agapao. It's not the term for human love, phileo. It's agapao. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. <clears throat> so he's asked about eternal life. Jesus has talked about heaven. It says that Jesus loved him, agapao, and Jesus tells him, all right, you want to know what's required of you? Take all the stuff you've got, sell it, give it to the poor, and follow me. Oh, and by the way, on the way, take up your cross and follow me. Verse 22. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And you know from our past studies, we've done studies on the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and the differences between the two. And the disciples were astonished at his words. In other words, that really took them by surprise. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Only two things that are listed for us as things that seem to be impossible, but they're possible with God, and that was the virgin birth. And then here, the salvation of those who are trusting in their riches. It's covetousness, as you know, from Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5. 5, covetousness is idolatry. <laughs> you trust an idol, it can't save you. Trust in Christ alone. The young rich man went away sorrowful but it says Jesus loved him one who was not among the elect and yet he was loved the text says so specifically that brings us to the three verses for tonight and helps us understand the background verses 19 through 21 wherefore my sentence is that we trouble them not which from among the Gentiles are turned to God but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Now you remember the context here is a challenge to grace and faith. That's the attack that we studied that we saw when we looked at the different forms of apostate Jewish legalism, apostate 
pagan legalism, heretical Jewish legalism, and heretical pagan or pagan uh, legalism. Four different attacks. The first two against the doctrines of salvation. The second two attacks against the doctrine of sanctification. The attacks that were being made were by those who were teaching a false way of salvation. That's where the wrestling match started out on the mission field. And it came back to Jerusalem where we found the attacks against sanctification by Jews who were believers but said you still had to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised, that it's needful to do so. And so that's our context of all of this discussion that we have here tonight. The way in which Peter, the apostle to the Jews, gave the definitive answer to those Judaizers, and Paul picks it up in the book of Galatians, that's the entire theme of the book of Galatians, was noting that even in the Old Testament, God determined to choose and save some Gentiles. It was a matter of grace. It was a matter of divine election. It was a matter of divine calling. It was not proselytism and law keeping. After they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. As we looked at those four different tests of apostate and Jewish legalisms and heretical Jewish and pagan legalisms, means of salvation and sanctification, we noted that it's all by grace through faith. I don't know how I can emphasize that strongly enough. But doesn't it strike you as rather strange that James gives his sentence, my sentence is, verse 19, that we trouble them not, which from the Gentiles are turned unto God, but here's what we want them to do. And he gives four things. Did you look at those four things? Four different things. Christians often do things that cause other Christians to stumble in their Christian lives and fall from grace. That's the issue we're dealing with here, but the four things that would cause someone to stumble from grace are listed in the text. Number one, that they abstain from pollutions of idols. Number two, from fornication. But then how odd, number three and number four, from things strangled and from blood. Some of those things relate to Gentiles, the first two, and some relate to Gentiles avoiding practices that would cause Jews to stumble. Did you notice that those last two relate to Jewish dietary laws? What's going on here? I mean, they've just argued that both your salvation and your sanctification are by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. Your salvation is not by works of the law. Your salvation is not by circumcision. Your salvation is certainly not by keeping Jewish dietary laws. We already dealt with that issue back in chapter 10 where Peter had the vision of the great sheet coming down from heaven. It was filled with all kinds of unclean animals. Why in the world would James, as the head of the Jerusalem council, all of a sudden slap two dietary laws in the midst of his conclusion after all the disputation has gone on when he, as the sitting judge, says, all right, here's the conclusion that we have to this matter. And two of the things that he lists are that they keep themselves from things strangled and from blood. Things strangled, of course, caused the blood to be forced into the tissue, and the Jews were prohibited from eating blood. They were supposed to pour it out upon the altar. And the second is like unto it. You can't have your... Um, blood sausages, guys, if you have to follow that rule there. You know, how many of you like to cook your pieces of chicken and got some chicken blood and it makes that a kind of a nice gravy kind of stuff? He's saying to them, first century, witnessing to Jews, trying to reach Jews, Jewish believers in Jerusalem, says, look, there are at least two things out of the dietary law that we need to make sure that the Gentiles observe. Some of those things relate directly to everybody, abstain from pollution of idols, abstain from fornication, but there are some things that clearly relate to Jewish dietary law, things strangled and from blood. The way we solve that problem is by looking at what we've studied over the last two weeks. The first two requirements that are listed in that passage tonight are what we've called transdispensational principles. We've discussed in some detail 
what the idea of a transdispensational principle is during these past two messages. A transdispensational rule is one that extends over two or more dispensations. It's, for example, something that was given before the fall and something that continues after the fall. Those are clearly two different periods in God's household economy. One, man is in a state of innocence. Second, man is in a state of guiltiness. In one, man is still alive spiritually, and in the second, man and all the descendants of Adam are in a, spirit, a state of spiritual death, all of Adam and his posterity. One of the two things that we have listed for us here is fornication. Moral standards related to sex and marriage trace back to creation not merely to the law of Moses. It wasn't okay to commit fornication before Moses gave the law. All the way back at the beginning, God established the principle, one man for woman for life. And fornication calls, calls, covers many, many different things. It certainly covers sex outside of marriage, but there are certain types of sex outside of marriage that are called adultery, where one party is married to another party. But fornication also covers bestiality. Fornication covers self-gratification. Fornication covers pornography. A fornication covers homosexuality. It covers lesbianism. It covers all kinds of a gamut of horrendously evil sexual sins. That all goes back to God's original establish of the establishment of the purpose of the sexual relationship, one man for one woman for life. Death breaks the marriage bond. And death alone breaks the marriage bond. The prohibitions against idolatry are found in every dispensation as well. Things polluted by idols, he says, keep away from that idolatry stuff. That's found in every dispensation. Worship of anything except the true God is a form of idolatry, and that includes covetousness. Paul tells us in Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5, 5, covetousness is idolatry, and the covetous man is an idolater. What do you think was the problem with the young man that Jesus loved and told him, go sell all the stuff you've got, give it to the poor, follow me, by the way, on the way, pick up your cross before you follow me. And he went away sorrowful. Jesus loved him, but he chose a different God. Jesus tried to bring him to the conclusion, I am God. He said, good master. He says, why do you call me good? There's only one good who's God. Did you get that? He was pointing out that the young man had a different God, a God that he wasn't willing to give up. He had the God of material things. He was covetous. He had a lot of good stuff. Man was at good stuff. He couldn't bear to part with the good stuff of this life. And he went away sorrowful. And Jesus says, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Covetousness is idolatry. That is a transdispensational principle. And God has a prohibition against it in every dispensation from the beginning to the end. So the first two are transdispensational principles. The second two prohibitions in our text tonight specifically relate to Jewish dietary laws. They do not even relate to the Ten Commandments. Did you notice that? However, these things were so offensive to Jews that their practice would present an insurmountable barrier to trying to reach Jews for Christ, at least in the first century. But take yourself back to Acts 10. It's already happened five chapters earlier. Acts chapter 10. Peter's been up on the household uh, housetop, and he falls into a trance while he's waiting for lunch. And the vision of the sheet descending three times comes down to him, and God's voice says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. In fact, it was the voice of Jesus because Peter says, not so, Lord. That's what he called Jesus. Peter recognized the voice. It's Jesus that speaks to Paul on the road to Damascus. I am Jesus whom thou kickest against. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It was Jesus speaking to Peter from heaven. It was Jesus speaking to Paul from heaven. Same Jesus, no difference. He always has the same standards. He is always holy. He is always righteous. He's always just. He's always good. And Jesus told Peter, all right, Peter, you as a Jew have got to eat something that's unclean. And Peter didn't want to do it. And as far as we know, Peter didn't rise, kill, and eat anything that was in any of those sheets. Instead, as the sheet was brought up to heaven for the third time, there was a knock at the door downstairs, and Gentiles showed up at the door, and Peter suddenly understood what God was trying to teach him. 
God was going to reach Gentiles, those who were unclean, more unclean than any of the unclean animals in the Old Testament. They were truly unclean in every possible way. And Peter goes with them, and Peter enters into the house of a Gentile, which is not a lawful thing for a man to do, and Peter points that out to him in his sermon in Acts chapter 10. So what is going on here in Acts chapter 15? Is James placing Gentiles back under the dietary laws of the Old Testament? I think not, based on the fact of chapter 10, and Peter's experience, and Peter giving his testimony, and James basing his conclusion on Peter's testimony. You've got to tie that together. James is not just sort of winging it, going out there on a limb. It's based on what Peter has said. James says so. So he's clearly not putting the Gentiles back under the dietary laws of the Old Testament. What is he saying? I think what he's saying here in these verses is that we must be willing to give up our rights. I'll talk about the reasons for that in a moment, but giving up our rights. That is so difficult for us as Christians to learn. We have responsibilities we can't give up because we've commanded to do certain things. But we have certain rights, if you will, certain blessings that come to us, living under grace, not being restrained in certain areas, but for the sake of our testimony, we are willing to give up certain things so that we might have a more effective testimony for our Lord Jesus Christ. We give up our rights, number one, for the sake of weaker brothers. There are weaker brothers out there who have not grown in their faith as much as you have grown. There are weaker brothers who are still stumbling around in the dark, trying to grow up spiritually, still in diapers, still don't really understand the grace of God and how it applies to the Christian life. We have a responsibility not to harm those who are weaker brothers. Number two, we must not harm or cause a bad testimony to those who need to hear the gospel of Christ. And that I think is what is going on here in Acts chapter 15 because it is a unit. We have men who still have the gift of apostle, who are still receiving divine revelation from God. The New Testament canon has not yet been completed. And we have this recorded as a, an established principle, which covers many things, just like we saw circumcision, is an illustration that covers many different areas that we would plug our stuff into, that we want to use for legalism, for sanctification or salvation. You can put all kinds of things in there. But the principle holds. So that's a lot different from placing a Gentile believer back under the dietary laws of the books of Moses. There are some key passages that relate to this. And I'd like you to look them up with me tonight. I mean, I usually just type these things out and read them to you. But I'd like you to look at them in your own Bibles. There's only one thing, though it comes in two different forms, only one thing that should be allowed as a stumbling block. Turn with me, if you will, over to 1 Peter, chapter 2, and verses 6 through 8. 1 Peter, chapter 2, and verses 6 through 8. By the way, if you haven't read the epistles of Peter recently, I encourage you to do so. They are great epistles that deal with spiritual growth and with the end of the world. You want to grow up before it happens. 1 Peter chapter 2 is dealing with spiritual growth. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And he talks about building us up as living stones into a spiritual house and a spiritual priesthood. But now get down to verses 6 through 8. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. Christ is called the elect one. He is the elect cornerstone. We talked about that a few minutes ago, about election, predestination, and so on. Here's one of the passages where Christ is called elect. 
precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Now these are quotations out of Psalm 118, verse 22, and then the next verse is a quotation out of Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being dis disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. A stone of stumbling. Remember, there's only one thing in two different forms <clears throat> that the scripture allows as a stumbling block. The first thing that he deals with here, he talks about the stone of stumbling, a rock of offense to those that stumble. And what do they stumble at? The word. Here's the written word. He's been quoting the written word. They stumble at the word being disobedient. And then we see the doctrine of reprobation in the last part of verse 8, whereunto also they were appointed. Not merely passed over, they were appointed. God's elective purposes include reprobation. God's elective purposes including choices to damnation. We don't like to hear that. It says so right here though. They stumble at the written word. Now let's look at another passage where it tells us that they stumble at Christ, the living word. Romans chapter 9. This is the only thing at which people should stumble when they come in contact with our testimony. Romans chapter 9 and verses 31 through 33. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Remember our discussion back here in Acts 15. You know, they've got to keep the law of Moses. They've got to be circumcised. It's necessary for salvation, the first group said. Well, it's needful, said the second group. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. Look at the next phrase. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And so we find in that first passage, in 1 Peter, there is the written word. In Romans 9, we find there is the living word. They stumble at Christ. Look over to Romans chapter 11, verses 7 through 11. The reason we're looking at these passages is the only thing in these two different forms that should be allowed as a stumbling block as we go forth with our testimony for Christ is the word of God whether the written word or the living word, that will be a stone of stumbling. You cannot remove that offense. Never try to remove the offense of the cross, but make sure that you, yourself, are not a stumbling block to others. Look at chapter 11, down in verses 7 and following. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. That's reprobation. That's the active work of God. That's not merely passing over them. God gave them the spirit of slumber. God gave them eyes that they should not see. God gave them ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. I say then, if they stumble that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall. Now listen, here we're back in Acts 15. Salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Folks, this is a major theme that we find all the way from Acts chapter 15, all the rest of the way through the entire New Testament. There is something that will cause both Jews and Gentiles to stumble. The written word of God, the living word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot change that. The Jews stumbled at the word of God and at Christ, and God had a specific purpose in it. 
And that was so that he could open the door of salvation to the Gentiles by faith and by grace. That's what Paul just said. Did you get that? I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid that through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. We're back in Acts 15. We're back at the Council of Jerusalem. We're back to Peter citing what happened in Acts chapter 10 with the bringing in of the Gentiles on a co-equal basis with the Jews into the body of Christ. Read your Bibles as a unit. Recognize that when we get to the doctrinal epistles, they're based on the historic realities of what happened in the book of Acts. That's why the book of Acts is so important to understand. It helps you open up the epistles of the New Testament. One other thing that focuses on Christ is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where again we find a stumbling block for the Jews. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. Christ is the one permissible stumbling block. The living word, the written word, the cross. It all focuses on Christ. Now, other things that should never be allowed as stumbling blocks. You and I must be very careful to give up our rights, even though we have certain rights, if it would cause a stumbling block in any of these areas. Look back at Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. The context here is, of course, dietary laws. Amazing. Wasn't that what we're talking about? back there in Acts chapter 15. And here's Paul writing to Gentiles with the Council of Jerusalem in mind. And listen to what he says. Verse 13 is our key verse. I'll read it first, but I want to put it in its context then. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now you may have a right, but if your exercise of that right causes a brother, we're talking about another Christian here, if it causes a brother to fall, you as a more mature Christian should have the maturity to say, I will restrict my own rights so that I do not cause a stumbling block to be placed in front of another believer. And that verse is written in the context of dietary laws. Look at this. What are you going to eat? Him that is weak in the faith. Ah, so we're going to be talking about weaker brothers here. And that's the conclusion Paul reached in verse 13. Receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. The um, vegetarian is the weak brother here in this passage. He thinks it's sinful to eat meat. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. If you're mature, you won't sit there and scorn him. You do have the right to eat meat. In fact, you have the right to eat any kind of meat. You can eat pork and you can eat shrimp, and some of you did, lots of it at the wedding banquet the other night. You can eat ham. A lot of you ate that up too. There was almost, I don't think any ham left. I think that was completely gone and just the ham bones for cooking soup. We don't have that problem here. There's nobody who is afraid about eating ham. But you can't scorn the one who chooses not to eat. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. You're the weaker brother, you decide to eat only vegetables. Okay, that's fine, you can eat vegetables. You're not required to eat meat. But don't judge the man who does. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. In other words, you're not his boss. Too many people usurp authority and pretend to be bosses when they're not. I have certain family members uh, among my children that tend to have that propensity where they want to be the boss and tell everybody else what to do, both brothers and their father. It's not so. Who art thou that judged another man's servant? 
to his own mastery standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. He gives another illustration. He gives the illustration of special holidays. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. In other words, do you remember there was a big word that I told you all that deals with these things that begins with an A? Does anybody remember that word? Oh, I'm so sad. <laughs> Adiaphorus, something that in and of itself is neither moral nor immoral. Something that in and of itself is neutral, but within its context can take on either a moral or an immoral taint. That's what we're dealing with here. Paul tells us that issue of what you eat is neither moral nor immoral in and of itself. Now, if you're a glutton, that's immoral. But the thing itself, by itself, outside of a context, is neither moral nor immoral. Same way with the special holidays. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He's doing it for the glory of God. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself. Now this is an important verse, verse 7. And no man dieth to himself. You are not an island. You live in a context. You are part, not merely of the church universal, the body of Christ in general, from the day of Pentecost to the day of the rapture, you are in the context of a body of believers gathered together in what we call a local church. No man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth to himself. When one dies, it affects us all. We are each important within the context of the body where God placed us. I feel that daily as I miss Judy and I see how it not only affected me and my children but how it affected this church how it affected the music how it affected Faith Christian School how it affected so many different aspects of ministry toward young people like topics for teens none of us liveth unto himself and none of us dieth unto himself for whether we live we live unto the Lord and whether we die we die unto the Lord whether we live therefore or die we are the Lord's for to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. And so he comes to this conclusion. Verse 9. Uh, 10, excuse me. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the Bema. Not the great white throne judgment. Only the unregenerate dead will stand at the great white throne judgment. But we will all who are believers stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You see a brother who's doing something that's not quite right, but it's something that Saudi offers. Now we're not talking the moral issues here. We've already settled that question. We're talking the Adiaphorus things. That's the context of Romans 14. He will give account to Christ for why he did what he did. That means you will give account to Christ for why you did what you did. Even in the neutral areas, and if you caused a brother to stumble by exercising your rights rather than curtailing your rights, you will give an account. That's what James is talking about in Acts chapter 15. That's what Paul is talking about here in Romans uh, chapter 14. Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Paul knows it. He's persuaded of it. He knows what happened to Peter in Acts chapter 10. He knows what took place at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 because he was there and he was arguing the side of faith and grace. Remember, Paul's the one arguing faith and grace, not law, not circumcision, not the dietary rules. 
He's arguing faith and grace. And yet he says to the Romans, this group of Gentiles, those where James says that we trouble not the Gentiles. He's writing to them, he says, I know that it's okay to eat anything that I want to eat. Notice what he says, though. It's not unclean of itself. It's adiaphora. It's in a neutral zone by itself. But nothing is outside of a context. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. You're not walking in love when you, knowing that offense is taking place, insist on doing it because it is, after all, your right. You're not walking in love. You're not walking charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Verse 19. Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For me, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Verse 21. Give up your rights. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself, before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Verse 23. I wish we would all have this verse seared into our consciences. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Paul hasn't lost it. Paul is still preaching faith and grace, but he makes it clear that if you're a weak brother and you violate your conscience because some other brother who thinks he's stronger is willing to do something, but it still is something that is painful to your conscience, if you doubt it, don't do it. He that doubteth is damned if he eats. Why? Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's a tough one for us because we all like to insist on our rights. Let me show you another passage. If you love your brother, you will not cause him to stumble. Remember Paul says, Thou walkest not charitably here in Romans 14. If you insist on your rights, instead of curtailing your own rights for the sake of weaker brothers, look over at 1 John chapter 2. We were in 1 John just a moment ago. We were also here in chapter 2 just a moment ago. But look here now at verses 9 and 10. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. Look at the last phrase. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. How do you prove that you love the brethren? You don't do things that cause them to stumble. You don't do things that cause them to violate their conscience. You don't do things that lead them into an area whereby they Think of it as questionable, but they do it because you're a stronger brother. You're doing it. You've insisted it's your right. You're telling them, come on, you do it too. And they don't do it in faith, and whatsoever is not of faith is sin. They've sinned. There are three tests in 1 John by which we know that we're saved and by which we can test others whether or not they're saved. Number one, is the doctrine of Christ. John makes this clear both in 1 John and in 2 John. If there come any into your house and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bidding Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. That's the doctrine of Christ. You carry anything, or someone comes to you who presents a different Christ, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, whoever it is that comes to the door. 
You don't even let them into your house. You don't even say, have a nice day. You don't want them to have a nice day. You hope they have a rotten day. You hope that they don't reach anybody else. You hope that they waste their entire day not reaching people, banging on doors and nobody answering. Doctrine of Christ. The second thing that's given in the gospel or in first John is the godly lifestyle. The man who trusts Christ and is saved, God takes him as he is, but God doesn't leave him as he is. God will transform his life. The third thing is what we have in our text here is love of the brethren. Those are the three tests for the true believer that God gives through John in first John chapters one through five. That's the whole book. You'll find all three of those things, continual themes, repetitive themes, said over and over in different, different ways as you go through those five chapters. Three things. Doctrine of Christ, godly lifestyle, love of the brethren. Those are the three tests that manifest openly, declaratively, that a man or woman is saved. Here he's dealing with that test about loving the brethren. He that saith he is in the light, so you can claim to be a Christian, and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. That's the practical test, even if you say something with your lips, but you hate your brothers, you're in darkness. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. That's not just saying you're in the light, that's abiding in the light. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Do you love your brethren enough to give up your rights? That's what John's dealing with here. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We've only got a couple more passages. I know I'm over time, but at least I want to hit the last two passages here. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Again, this is a context in which the dietary laws are being discussed. Same issues that were troubling people back in Jerusalem. Paul is writing, he's the apostle of the Gentiles. We trouble not the Gentiles with those things. But we saw two dietary laws were listed for us in that statement that James makes when he gives his conclusion, his judgment in that chapter. Here we find dietary laws and things offered to idols. Remember that was one of the other of the four things that were listed for us in Acts chapter 15. Our key verse is verse 9. I'll read that first, but look at the context later. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Paul is concerned that our, quote, Christian liberty would in some sense become a stumbling block to weaker brothers. Now let's look at the context. Starting in verse 1, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet, as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in this world, and that there is none other God but one. So, idols are nothingness. Idols are pieces of rock, pieces of metal, pieces of wood, pieces of whatever. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, and of him are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Now you know that, says Paul. I know that. My theology and my life are built on that, says Paul. Verse 7, but everybody doesn't know that. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Now he's going to say the same thing in these following verses that he said over in Romans chapter 14. Meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. You're allowed to eat all that stuff. You can even eat stuff that was offered in a pagan temple to an idol. It doesn't have idol cooties on it. It doesn't have specialized idol germs that will kill you sooner than if you didn't eat it. 
but it may cause the weaker brother to stumble. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Now, it's okay to eat it, but he's got a weak conscience, and he sees you as the stronger brother doing it, and you know this is going to offend his conscience. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Paul is giving us principles that you apply, not merely across the board, okay, I'm going to give up eating meat. I'll become a vegetarian. Then you fall into the category of the weak brother of, uh, of Romans chapter 14. You have to determine in each context in which you find yourself not the issues that have already been determined by Scripture, those moral issues like fornication, for example. The worshiping of idols themselves, you can't do that. But the things that are neither moral nor immoral in and of themselves. Do you remember the word? Adiaphorus. Important term. Precise term, a term that will help you understand when Paul is dealing with these issues, which the church was wrestling with in Acts chapter 15. Paul says, I'm willing to give up my rights. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. One final passage and then we're done. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Here we are in the middle of the letters to the seven churches. If you've been coming on Wednesday evening, you've seen some of these places on the video screen. Pergamos was one of them, Pergamum. Fascinating place, and we saw the different types of devil worship that was going on there through the different pagan temples. An incredible place that most people have never seen, even in pictures. And we heard an incredible lesson on Pergamos, and that's what we find, our context here, in Revelation 2.14. We'll start in verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know, where thy, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. That was a bad town. The devil lived there. The devil is a local being. He's not infinite. He's not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at one time. He has a great network of demons scattered all around the world. They communicate very rapidly with one another, but the devil can only be in one place at one time. And when John wrote this letter from Jesus, he's the amanuensis for Jesus. He's the scribe that's writing down what Jesus is telling him. At that time, the devil lived in Pergamos. Does he live in Washington today? We used to think he might live in Moscow. Does he live in Beijing? Where is the devil's place of residence today? At that time, it was Pergamos. But I have a few things against thee. Now listen to verse 14. Some specific charges. Because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Balaam, what was it that led Balaam astray? Covetousness. He desperately wanted the money. And so he figured out a way to make Israel fall into sin, even though he couldn't curse Israel. What was it? Amazing. It was one of the four things that are listed for us in Acts chapter 15. It was fornication. Taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Oh, and there's a second thing here too. To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. <laughs> I hope you're beginning to get the picture that the New Testament is a unit. That it is given by the Holy Spirit, all of it, that it is all in compliance and conformity with the prophecies of the Old Testament. 
but it all points to Jesus and it all gives to us the way in which we are supposed to live so that we bear a testimony to the world and so that we do not cause weaker brothers to stumble, that the more mature believers are willing to give up their rights as Christ gave up his rights. Do you understand Christ gave up his rights? He left heaven's glory. He became a man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Jesus gave up his rights. If you would reflect Jesus for the sake of the weaker brothers, for the sake of your testimony before a watching world, you must give up your rights. Even though you may have those rights, you make a choice. Because that's what brings glory to God. Well, a lot of things that we've covered tonight, covered them rather quickly, but I hope in particular you picked up Romans chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Those are key passages dealing with stumbling blocks. And that's what we have going on in Acts chapter 15. Two things that are moral issues that transcend all of time. The issue of sexual morality, the issue of idolatry. Two things that in that context were absolutely necessary to keep the weaker believers at Jerusalem from stumbling at the knowledge that stronger believers had. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray that you help us to learn the principles, not merely taking the specific items and the specific issues and thinking that everything else is free game. Help us to learn the principles that you're teaching us through the illustrations that are given to us in the New Testament so that we might live lives that are pleasing to Jesus Christ. Lives of Christian maturity, lives of love for the weaker brothers, not causing them to stumble. One of the proofs of our salvation, one of the open manifestations that we are indeed yours, not doing things that you consider hateful to the weaker brothers because we've insisted on our own rights. We don't follow Jesus who gave up his rights so that we might be saved. Father, take your word, we pray, and use it in our hearts this night, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening is hymn number 333, again, the walk of faith, trusting Jesus every day. 333, let's stand to sing all four verses. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly, Trusting as the days go by, trusting him whatever befall, trusting Jesus that is all. Brightly doth his spirit shine into this poor heart of mine. He leads, I cannot fall, trusting Jesus, that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him, whatever befall. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Singing, if my way is clear, praying, if the path be drear, if in danger for him call, trusting 
Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him, whatever befall, trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting Him while life shall last, trusting Him till earth be past, till within the just wall, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting us days go by, trusting him water before, trusting Jesus that is all. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and ever. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming. And please greet your neighbors.